memories of were just banging rhythms on the floor or tables or the fridge. And my folks bought me a drum set when I was really little, like I'm talking six or seven. I've got pictures of me playing the little, you know, Simpson Sears drum set with the girls dancing on the bass drum. Uh, and I never thought about it. It was kind of unconscious. I just followed it and did it because I loved it. And then there was a point where I remember very clearly that I was going to be a musician and I was listening to, um, I was listening to Ravel and I think it was the Mother Goose Suite or Daphnis and Chloe. I can't remember, but I was really into Ravel when I was a teenager and I was probably about 14 or 15 at the time and it just hit me right there and I said, wow, this is, this is God talking to me. You got to do this. I even remember the first time I, I seriously thought that I could do something else that it kind of occurred to me was when I was well into my 20s. I was probably 27 or 28 and I wasn't working that much. And I thought, yeah, maybe I should actually get another job. <laughs> and I thought, geez, what could I do? I could drive a car. I don't have any other talents. I could drive a car and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that lasted for about three days, and then I realized I wasn't going to do anything else. <laughs> you know, there's many kinds of teachers, as there's many kinds of people. But in general, you can often say that te there's often the kind of supportive, open um, type of teacher. And then there's, there's the more strict disciplinarian, my way or the highway type of teacher. And I always ended up with the first kind almost always and I think that helped me a lot because I'm a pretty uh, sensitive kind of guy and I don't take to being bullied very well. <laughs> I just kind of shut down when people push me hard. But I remember when I finished my undergrad at studying with Ross Hartenberg that he actually said that to me. He said you'd probably benefit by somebody who would push you just because he didn't push me that in that way. I mean he pushed me in, certainly in the way of offering work and saying try this and experiment with that and uh, I never felt like I lacked for anything teaching with him, studying with him or anybody else. But when I look back on it, almost all of my teachers were those kind of supportive types. My first percussion teacher was Craig Reiner in Halifax, in the Halifax School Systems. I don't know if you know Craig. And then I studied with Jim Faraday for a year. And Jimmy can be pretty abrasive, but he's a nice guy underneath. I did a master's in California and I studied with John Bergamo, who is also another sweet low-key kind of guy. I never studied formally with John Wire, but I put him up as one of my principal teachers as a musician and as a person. I think I learned more from John than almost anybody because he was an amazing dude. Growing up in Halifax, I was playing rock drums in a rock band and uh, studying at Dalhousie with Jim Faraday and I had no intention of leaving. My I was my plate was full and I was happy doing all the things I love to do. And then I saw Nexus do a concert and it it was like, whoa, I just gotta go and spend some time with these guys. It's like stuff I'd never seen before. You know, they played African music and they played some ragtime and they did some free improvisation and they did some contemporary music and I just it wasn't a it wasn't as, a, as much of a choice as it was, I just got to go and see what's going to happen. And so I enrolled a, at U of T in order to be close to them and to work with Russell. But I, at that point, I didn't even see myself getting an undergrad degree. I didn't, I didn't have any interest in graduating, or, but, I, but it was the best way to work with them. Every step of my life has been like that. I had no, no interest in gamelan music before I was exposed to it through the Evergreen Club. It was the same with my interest in jazz and everything. I've just... The things that speak to me, I say, okay, I'll follow this for a while and I'll study it and see what I can do with it. And uh, I continue to do that, I think, my whole life.
through a lot of the 80s, I played a lot of marimba, and I really loved that instrument, and I still have a nice relationship with it, but I, I stopped playing it after a while, and I gravitated more towards drums, doing some hand drumming. I can't say there's any one thing. I love playing the imbira because it's, it's a very intimate thing that you don't often get in the percussion world. You know, percussion tends to be a little bit in your face, but you can't play an imbira loud or super fast. There's something ref really reflective about it, and I like that feeling. I really established a nice bond with triangle playing at one point in my life because I spent a couple of years playing with a Cajun band, Swamparella. I don't know if you know those guys. Triangle is the main percussion instrument in Cajun music. And I didn't know anything about it until I, they asked me to play with them on a whim. They needed somebody at the last minute. I don't know if I've ever told you that story, but I met them at a folk festival. I was playing with another group, and they'd had a fight, and their percussionist left. And they said, we have a show in 45 minutes. You know, you have to play with us. So I, they just gave me some basics, and, and I ended up playing with them for the next two years. They taught me how to, and I listened to all of this repertoire. And it's a very kind of zen thing when you get into playing triangle because there's no drummer. You're the drummer on a triangle. And there's really only two grooves. There's there's either a waltz or a two-step. It's in three or two and four, and that's all there is. So uh, I, I, I created a, I got a kind of a bond with the triangle. I don't play triangle anymore. They kicked me out of the group. <laughs> <laughs> they said I was overqualified. <laughs> I don't know if I have a strong enough voice or need to be a soloist. Oh, I've played some solo repertoire, but it doesn't excite me nearly as much as working with other musicians and interacting with them and creating a third thing. You know, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades kind of musician, so I, I don't, I'm not a specialist. I've never said to myself, I'm going to be like a jazz vibraphone player and that's my identity. But I love playing jazz vibes. I've learned a lot from studying jazz and uh, for me, music is like languages, and I like learning different languages so I can communicate with people in different ways. It's really interesting to me what's the aesthetic of jazz as opposed to what's the aesthetic of contemporary music or what's the aesthetic of gamelan music. And so I'm not a specialist in any of those things, but I like to learn sort of, you know, the essentials of what's important maybe to the people who create that music, for example, what's important to Sundanese musicians when they hear music, what, are they, what, what makes the music really sing for them. I don't really think about technique much when I'm performing. I just, I, you either have to trust that it's there, or if it's not there, there's nothing you can do about it, so why think about it, you know? It's kind of like the, I remember reading a book where the Dalai Lama said he never worries about anything. Because he said there's only two contexts where, that he can imagine, he can envision. One is that he's got a situation where he can do something to improve it, so he does what he can do. 
and there's a situation where he can't do anything because it's out of his hand, so he doesn't worry because it's out of his hands. <laughs> and I kind of feel like that. Uh, by the time you get to the performance stage, you can't practice, you can't cram technique, right? So you've either done the homework and it's there, so you're good, or you can't do anything about it, so why worry about it? <laughs>